Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the July installment of the Acton Lecture Series on the topic of Herbert Hoover versus the Great Depression. My name is Noah Gould, and I manage alumni and student programs here at the Acton Institute. I would like to thank our generous donors, as well as all who make events like these possible. The format of this event will be a 30-minute lecture, followed by Q&A. This event is being recorded and streamed live, so please wait for the microphone to be passed to you for your question. It is my privilege today to introduce Dr. George Nash. Dr. Nash was born in Holyoke, Massachusetts. He received his PhD in history from Harvard University. Dr. Nash is the author of The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America since 1945, which is considered a foundational work in its field. Dr. Nash is the, an authority on the life of President Herbert Hoover. Between 1975 and 1995, he lived in Iowa near the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, where he prepared three volumes of a definitive scholarly biography under the general title, The Life of Herbert Hoover. He was commissioned for this project by the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Association. When volumes one and two appeared in 1983 and 1988, he presented copies to Ro President Ronald Reagan in Oval Office ceremonies in the White House. He is the editor of Freedom Betrayed, Herbert Hoover's Secret History of the Second World War and Its Aftermath, and of The Crusade Years, 1933 to 1955, Herbert Hoover's Lost Memoir of the New Deal Era and Its Aftermath. An independent scholar, historian, and lecturer with specialties in 20th century American political and intellectual history, Dr. Nash speaks and writes frequently about the history and present direction of American conservatism, the life of Herbert Hoover, the legacy of Ronald Reagan, the education of the Founding Fathers, and other subjects. His writings have appeared in the American Spectator, National Review, New York Times Book Review, Wall Street Journal, as well as Acton's own publication, Religion and Liberty, among many, many others. He's a senior fellow at the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal. Since 2004, he has been associate of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. Dr. Nash brings a clarity and depth to complex topics that is rare. I'm grateful to call him a friend and so pleased to have him join us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nash. Thank you, Noah, for that very gracious introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. It is both a pleasure and an honor to be in your company as the guest of the Acton Institute. And I want to thank Noah and your colleagues for inviting me to this platform and for all the courtesies you have extended to me. On March 4, 1929, Herbert Hoover was sitting on top of the world. As he took his oath of office that day to be President of the United States, he could look back on a career path that had curved unbrokenly upward. Born in Iowa in 1874 and orphaned before he was 10, by 1914, Hoover was an internationally acclaimed mining engineer living in London. When World War I broke out that year, he quickly became an international humanitarian hero by creating an unprecedented relief commission that delivered food for more than four years to the entire civilian population of German-occupied Belgium, which was under constant threat of starvation. Belgium was just the beginning. Between 1914 and the early 1920s, Hoover directed, financed, or assisted a multitude of relief endeavors in Europe without parallel in the history of mankind. Tens of millions of people owed their lives to his exertions. It was later said of him that he saved more lives than any other person in history. During the 1920s, the great humanitarian, as he eventually came to be called, ascended still higher on the ladder of public esteem. As Secretary of Commerce in the cabinets of Presidents Harding and Coolidge, Hoover became one of the three or four most influential men in the U.S. government. In certain ways, he was a progressive and reformer. 
he openly repudiated the doctrine of laissez-faire and advocated some governmental regulation of private enterprise. But he also emphatically rejected old world socialism and outright government direction of business. He called his political philosophy in a book of that title, American Individualism, a philosophy grounded in what he called America's most precious social ideal, the ideal of equality of opportunity. Hoover was too much of an engineer to content himself merely with praising America's social system. When the nation's economy fell into a severe recession in 1921, he persuaded Warren Harding to convene a President's Conference on Unemployment with Hoover as its chairman and driving force. This highly publicized conference laid the intellectual foundation for his presidential response to the Great Depression a decade later. The conference popularized the idea that the government should not sit still during an economic slump. To the contrary, it should act to mitigate such downturns, especially by counter-cyclical expenditures on public works. Hoover scoffed at the classical economic teaching that business cycle fluctuations were inevitable. Instead, he believed that the national economy could be managed by cooperation and what he called coordination between the federal government and the private sector. At the heart of his political philosophy was a vision of a vast informal partnership between a federal government equipped with scientific data about economic conditions and a private economy led by enlightened trade associations. Hoover's approach has come to be known as associationalism. To him, it was a proven progressive formula for non-coercive, non-political promotion of the general welfare. By 1928, Hoover's reputation was immense. As he campaigned for the presidency that year, some of his supporters produced a film about him with the title, Herbert Hoover, Master of Emergencies. And you can watch it today on YouTube. In November, he was elected president in a landslide and without ever having held an elective public office. Once inaugurated, Hoover acted quickly to fulfill the public's great expectations. Privately, however, the new president was not as sanguine about the future as he appeared to be. For several years, he had watched with apprehension as the stock market had soared to spectacular heights, a surge fueled by massive investor borrowing of money to buy shares. As Secretary of Commerce, he had tried in vain behind the scenes to nudge the Federal Reserve Board into restraining the bull market. In the spring and summer of 1929, the nervous chief executive again attempted to persuade the Federal Reserve Board and the barons of Wall Street as well to break the speculative fever. His largely covert actions had little effect. When the crash finally came in October, Hoover's first response was to assure the nation that the fundamental business of the country, his term, and he had defined that as the production and distribution of commodities, was, again in his words, on a sound and prosperous basis. But as the market's downward spiral continued, he realized that the debacle's effects had not been confined to Wall Street. The national psyche itself had suffered a shock. If the spreading mood of fear, uncertainty, and hesitation in business were not checked, he said, the economy could plunge into a grievous depression. Hoover now took steps that changed the course of American history. Instead of allowing the business downturn to run its course, he intervened on a scale unmatched by any previous president. In 
convinced that the country's difficulties were psychological, a term he used, he dominated the public stage with a flourish of activism. He convened a series of conferences at the White House with business leaders who pledged to maintain wage scales at their current level in defiance of economic orthodoxy. A high wage policy, he and many others argued, would sustain purchasing power and thus stimulate future production of goods. Hoover also conferred with leading labor leaders who promised not to strike or seek destabilizing wage increases during the emergency. To counter an expected uptick in unemployment, he promised that the federal government would augment its public works expenditures in a big way. He asked the nation's governors to do the same. To Hoover, these measures were not eccentric nostrums. They reflected the teachings of an increasingly popular proto-Keynesian so-called new economics that he and others had been promulgating since the unemployment conference of 1921. His program of recovery won widespread public approval. In effect, Hoover was practicing a kind of psychotherapy designed to restore the nation's badly shaken confidence. Confidence, that to him was the key to renewal of prosperity. By stabilizing the economy through a high wage policy, industrial peace, public work spending and other actions, he believed that he could defeat the fear of unemployment and the emotions, again his word, that were threatening an economic breakdown. Both then and forever after, Hoover was proud of the extraordinary agreements he had forged, proud of his break with the fatalism of laissez-faire. Confidently, deliberately, and self-consciously, he had abandoned the principle of political non-interference with the business cycle. As never before, the President of the United States had placed one man, himself, in charge of guiding the nation back to prosperity. And having done so, he was quick to proclaim success. On March 7, 1930, he told a news conference that, I'm, I'm quoting now, all the evidences indicate that the worst effects of the crash upon employment will have been passed during the next 60 days. Less than two months later, in an address to the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, he said, I am convinced we have now passed the worst, and with continued unity of effort, we shall rapidly recover. He declared his great economic experiment, that, had, that his great economic experiment, his term, had, again quoting, succeeded to a remarkable degree. Hoover's optimistic prophecies of early 1930 eventually cost him dearly in public disillusionment. But at that juncture, they did not appear so outlandish. Many other seasoned observers and analysts, including distinguished economists, shared his belief that the worst was or very soon would be over. And many gave him credit for calming the public mood immediately after the crash. For a time, it appeared that Hoover's policy of cooperative action outside of government, an interesting term, had been vindicated. In the early months of 1930, the stock market recovered much of the ground it had lost during the previous autumn. But then, as would happen repeatedly in the next three years, just when Hoover thought he had restored economic equilibrium, unexpected turbulence arose. In June 1930, Congress enacted and Hoover approved the highly protectionist Smoot-Hawley tariff. Hoover took solace from its flexible rate provision that permitted the president upon recommendation by the Tariff Commission to raise or reduce tariffs by as much as 50%. In this way, the White House technocrat reasoned, he could take tariff making out of politics 
and adjust rates on a scientific basis. And I don't believe he would have signed the bill without that provision for which he fought hard. Now, just how destructive the Smoot-Hawley tariff proved to be remains actually a subject of some debate. But psychologically, its impending enactment appeared to upset the edifice of confidence that Hoover had been building. As the congressional struggle over the tariff reached a climax, the stock market tumbled in what was described as a torrent of liquidation. By mid-June, when the new tariff took effect, the market had wiped out virtually all of its gains of the past seven months. Then, in the summer of 1930, across much of the Midwest and South, the worst drought yet recorded in American history ravaged the crops of 30 states. Millions of acres of planted fields were ruined. Farm income in the devastated region fell by 25%. No one could blame Hoover for the drought. But as 1930 wore on, a number of commentators became critical of his performance as president. Time and again, they accused him of timidity and vacillation in his dealings with Congress. Hoover, said the pundit Walter Lippmann, suffered from a peculiar weakness. He had not yet mastered the political art. It is easy to see why politicians in both parties distrusted him. He was simply not one of their kind. His aura of impersonal efficiency, his dislike of political rituals, his workaholic seriousness, and his reliance on non-political experts set him apart from what he derided as the beer garden on Capitol Hill. That was during Prohibition. He was also difficult to pin down ideologically. His unusual blend of progressivism and anti-statism pleased neither the left nor the right. For his part, Hoover believed, as he told an audience shortly after the crash, that the most dangerous animal in America is the man with an emotion and a desire to pass a new law. Privately, he was more pungent. He labeled one senator the only verified case of a negative IQ. <laughs> When, he, when in 1930, one of Hoover's granddaughters was born, his first response was, I'm glad she doesn't have to be confirmed by the Senate. <laughs> in a whimsical mood one day, he remarked, there ought to be a law allowing the president to hang two men a year and without being required to give any reason. <laughs> As the political headwinds against him gathered force, the president gave little sign of reconsidering his policies. Convinced as ever that the key to recovery was the revival of a spirit of confidence, he asked the American Bankers Association in October of 1930 to instill a feeling of assurance in their clients. He appealed to the bankers to improve their <coughs> borrowers' courage and mental attitude. In December, he advised Congress that the best contribution that government could make to economic recovery was to encourage what he called the voluntary cooperation of the community. Meanwhile, new manifestations of what Hoover called frozen confidence were appearing. In the autumn of 1930, a growing number of significant American banks began to fail. It was now apparent that the economic slump was not a typical transitory recession. It was something worse. In 1931, the pace of bank failures quickened, abetted by a deepening financial crisis in Europe. In September, the turmoil abroad took a stunning turn when Great Britain was forced to abandon the almost sacrosanct gold standard. Britain's decision triggered a financial tsunami in the United States. 
Fearful that the U.S. dollar would be the next currency to devalue, many foreign depositors rushed to withdraw their holdings in the form of gold from American banks. Many domestic depositors also sought safety by removing their savings from banks and hoarding the money at home. Lacking sufficient reserves to accommodate the stampede, more than 500 U.S. banks collapsed in a single month. By the end of December 1931, a total of 2,294 American banks had failed during that year alone. Desperate to stem what he called a degenerating vicious cycle, Hoover reached out to the nation's banking elite. Early in October, he secretly convened a group of leading New York bankers. He asked them to voluntarily organize a private banking corporation with a capital of $500 million, a lot of money in those days, to be supplied by the banking community itself. The corporation would use this fund to lend assistance to banks that, in Hoover's words, were under attack by unreasoning depositors. By rescuing these tottering banks from the danger of closure, this new corporation, he hoped, would revive public confidence in the banking system. The New York bankers reluctantly acquiesced. But only after Hoover promised them, promised them that if necessity requires, he would ask Congress to create a governmental banking entity patterned after the War Finance Corporation created in World War I. It soon transpired that the worried bankers had less faith in Hooverian cooperation than he did. Unwilling to risk their own capital to save their weaker brethren, and anxious for Uncle Sam to assume the burden, the corporation's organizers procrastinated and loaned out less than $10 million in the first few weeks of its existence. For Hoover, the fateful moment of decision was now at hand. According to an old adage that H.L. Mencken popularized, in politics, a man must learn to rise above principle. This Herbert Hoover now did. Yielding to the perceived dictates of necessity, he called upon Congress in December 1931 to enact a program of emergency governmental action to end the nation's growing credit paralysis. He asked Congress to establish a Reconstruction Finance Corporation with broad power to lend money directly to beleaguered banks and other commercial institutions. Never before had a peacetime president proposed to intervene so massively in the workings of private enterprise. Not bankers, not investors, not captains of industry, but the government itself would now attempt to lubricate the nation's credit channels and make the wheels of commerce turn again. In January 1932, Congress voted overwhelmingly to establish the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. During the next five months, the RFC authorized more than 5,000 loans to more than 4,000 banks and other commercial institutions in financial difficulty. The RFC did not restore the nation's confidence, but it did save many businesses from ruin and quelled local and regional financial brush fires that might easily have turned into a national conflagration. Yet even as Hoover embraced government-funded credit expansion and other intrusions into the market economy, he simultaneously donned the heavy armor of fiscal conservatism. If confidence in the economy was to be revived, he announced, the federal government must raise taxes and rigorously balance its budget, which was now running its largest peacetime deficit in American history. The financial stability of the U.S. government, as measured by a balanced budget, 
was absolutely essential, he believed, if the government were to prevent another disastrous run on the dollar and preserve the all-important gold standard. This incidentally, and I must emphasize this point, was not just Hoover's thinking in 1932. It was the prevailing orthodoxy of the time. Few Republicans or Democrats dissented, although they argued about which kinds of taxes might be raised. In June of 1932, Congress enacted, and Hoover signed into law, the largest peacetime tax increase up to that date in American history. Meanwhile, the deepening depression was taking a growing toll in human misery. By mid-1932, something like 20% of the American labor force was out of work. During 1931 and early 1932, Hoover had stoutly resisted a growing clamor on the American left for direct financial federal assistance to individuals. He had exhorted his fellow Americans to maintain their traditional system of mutual self-help, voluntary giving, and local governmental responsibility for people in need. Any tapping into the federal coffers, he warned, any federal usurpation of these local and private voluntary responsibilities would strike at the roots of self-government, he said, and lay the foundations for the destruction of our liberties. Sounding at times like an Old Testament prophet, he had admonished Americans to solve their problems outside of government and reject the opiates of public charity. Moreover, he had practiced what he preached. In August 1931, August, uh, Hoover established the President's Organization on Unemployment Relief to coordinate the country's relief preparations for the coming winter. The new committee would dispense no federal money. Rather, it would assist the existing network of local, state, and non-governmental relief agencies in an elaborate national campaign for private contributions. In mid-October, Hoover himself initiated the appeal on national radio. By early winter, when the effort wound up, it had raised approximately $100 million. It would be more than 10 times that amount in today's money, at least. $100 million. It had been the most successful volunteer fund drive in American history. But was it enough? In the spring of 1932, facing the growing exhaustion of state and local resources for relief of the unemployed, as well as tremendous pressure from Congress, Hoover proposed a program of federal relief funding channeled through the states. Although he insisted that the fundamental policy of state, local, and private responsibility for relief had not changed, there was no denying that he had been forced by partisan necessity and by a growing national consensus to rise above principle again. Hoover's political somersault, as one enemy called it, astonished official Washington and touched off a Donnybrook with Congress over the precise terms of the legislation. As finally enacted in July, the Emergency Relief and Construction Act, among other things, authorized the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to lend, notice the word lend now, up to $300 million to the states to finance relief for needy and distressed people. Like the RFC, the Emergency Relief and Construction Act broke the barriers to a new era of big government. By accepting federal intervention in this form, first for economic recovery and then for general relief, Hoover and Congress had taken a major step toward Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And having done so, Hoover seemed determined to go no further. In the autumn of 1932, as this ERCA Act was getting organized and turned into bureaucratic machinery, Hoover was campaigning for re-election, and as he campaigned unsuccessfully for re-election, he reaffirmed his voluntaristic faith, and again, notice this formulation, in self-government by the people outside of the government. 
and he lashed out at the statist regimentation that he sensed would be at the heart of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. In a climactic campaign address, Hoover warned that the election was more than a contest between two men or two parties. It was a contest, he said, between two philosophies of government, and its outcome would determine the nation's course for over a century to come. For the rest of his life, he regarded this as one of his most prophetic utterances. In 1933, Hoover left office a political pariah. But this was not the end of the story. Rising from the ashes of his political immolation, he waged until his death in 1964 what he called a crusade against collectivism and became Franklin Roosevelt's most formidable critic from the right. Hoover perceived in the New Deal not a pragmatic response to economic distress, but something more sinister, a form of collectivism that, if unchecked, would destroy the very foundations of American life. Identifying, him, identifying himself with what he now called historic liberalism, he relentlessly assailed what he termed the false liberalism and totalitarian tendencies of the New Deal. On one occasion, he declared, the New Deal having corrupted liberalism for collectivism, coercion, and concentration of political power, it seems historic liberalism must be conservatism in contrast. And thus, in the final phase of his long political journey, Hoover became a man of the right. During his four years as president, Hoover in certain ways foreshadowed the New Deal. But in the larger sweep of the 20th century, Hoover as a former president contributed mightily to containing the New Deal and to reinvigorating the political philosophy that he had expounded in the White House. In the process, he forged a critique of ever aggrandizing statism that has become integral to modern American conservatism. It was among the most enduring of his legacies. So, how shall we judge Hoover's leadership during the Great Depression? It seems to be a near consensus among historians that Hoover's presidency was a failure. According to one narrative, favored by liberal historians and shaped by Keynesian economics, Hoover fell short because he was too anti-statist too committed to voluntary cooperation, and too devoted to fiscal conservatism and the gold standard. In this interpretation, the Great Depression was a crisis of capitalism, and Hoover's failing was that he did too little too late. A competing narrative favored by many free market economists argues that the Great Depression was not a crisis of capitalism, but a failure of government whose interventionist policies profoundly exacerbated the nation's economic woes. Among these policy errors, it has been argued, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, the tax increase of 1932, and the high wage policy that Hoover insisted upon in 1929. In this line of interpretation, Hoover's failing was not that he did too little, but that he did too much. Both of these schools of scholarship, you will notice, are Hoover-centric. But there is another perspective on him that I invite you to consider as I close. Between 1929 and 1933, the supply of money in the United States contracted by nearly one-third a staggering, almost unbelievable decline. Why did this happen? In their monumental Monetary History of the United States, published in 1963, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz placed the blame squarely on the policies, passivity, and ineptitude of the Federal Reserve Board, the legal guardian of the nation's monetary system. It is a complicated story. But in the judgment of Friedman and Schwartz, it was the Fed 
that was mainly responsible for converting what they called a garden variety recession into a major catastrophe. Since 1963, Friedman and Schwartz's indictment of the Fed has won considerable acceptance among economists and reinforcement from the Fed's principal historian, Alan Meltzer. But if Friedman, Schwartz, Meltzer, and their fellow monetarists are substantially correct, what should we now say about Herbert Hoover? In all of American history, no president has been more conscientious and hardworking than he. For three years and more, he strove without stint to induce the American people to shake off their frozen confidence. Repeatedly, he pleaded with banks to resume lending, with depositors to stop hoarding, and for morale-building action that would arrest the deepening credit freeze. Could it be that his incessant labors were not so much right or wrong as irrelevant? It reminds me of the Greek mythological figure, Sisyphus, forever condemned to push a heavy boulder up a hill. Every time he nearly reached the top, the top, the rock would roll back down and Sisyphus would have to start over. From 1929 to 1933, Herbert Hoover arguably was our modern Sisyphus. Every time that he seemed to be on the brink of success in taming the Great Depression, some new crisis would erupt, while the silent killer, the contraction of the money supply, would grind on. Each time, like Sisyphus, he would start over, unaware that much of his perpetual motion may have been doomed to, futi to futility by the monetary policies of a government agency beyond his control. So I leave you with this food for thought. Perhaps someday historians will conclude that Hoover's presidency was stymied not so much by his political limitations, political philosophy, or policies, but by something neither he nor virtually anyone else at the time quite understood, the fatal misjudgments and errors of the Federal Reserve Board. Thank you. Um, I understand there is time for questions, and there will be someone with a microphone. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll call in you, and then the mic will be provided so that I can hear your question. Yes, right over there. Fine. Start with an easy question. Uh, how would Herbert Hoover govern today? How would Herbert Hoover govern today? Today. I, first of all, I, I doubt that he would recognize the complexity <laughs> and enormity of the, of the federal government. For example, there is no Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in existence during Hoover's time when all those banks were failing. That would be one, one example. Um, there, is not, uh, there was not the expectation of massive federal intervention that has now become commonplace. Now that there's any jittering in the economy, we all turn to the White House and Congress and so on automatically. We expect the, the president and the uh, political elites to respond, and they are judged upon how much they manage, the, uh, how well they manage the economy. So I think Hoover, though, if you look at his later uh, prophecies and, and uh, arguments against the New Deal, would, would probably still want the gold standard. Uh, for example, he would probably be a fiscal hawk uh, as he's turned into, especially uh, in the last two years of the Depression. And he turned into it part, primarily because he thought that the gigantic de federal deficit would undermine foreign investors' confidence in our stability, and that would lead to a run on the dollar and the collapse of the gold standard and all sorts of bad things would, presume, would presumably happen. So I suspect he would be... Um, um, something, uh, if he's consistent now with what he was then, you know, uh, obviously times change and I recognize it's a hypothetical, but it's interesting that the Hooverian specter, uh, or perspective, uh, uh, perspective rather, on, uh, on this time would be, um, I think, uh, interesting in another respect. He was greatly concerned that 
if we gave up our system of local relief, that $100 million that was raised that I mentioned, a lot of that went to the United Way around the country to provide support for hospital systems that were running deficits and so forth. So there was this network which he believed was still viable. And by traditional standards, it was, but the need had gotten to be so so utterly overwhelming. The school teachers of Chicago didn't get paid for several months. Pennsylvania had a million men out of work. There was no unemployment insurance, you see. So the, the, what, what Ronald Reagan called the safety net and what the, the liberal historians and such might call the welfare state was not in place. Hoover was relying, if you will, on the welfare society to take care of it. And he was very concerned that the state would come in and suck the energy out of that and replace it and lead to a kind of a politicization of society. And he regarded himself as prophetic. He said that under his program of organizing all these relief uh, networks around the country and providing money through exhortation for private giving and so on, he said that that was done on a non-political basis. Generally, it was the, the leading men and women of the community who took, took the, the initiative. It wasn't political machines. But by 1935, after Roosevelt had come in and set up the WPA and the PWA and other agencies that provided direct checks to unemployed who were then doing some maybe work like the Civilian Conservation Corps and, and such, that the, the private sector giving went down to a trivial amount. The Red Cross had done a great deal, and Hoover relied heavily on the Red Cross during his presidency, and there are people who've argued the Red Cross was, was not sufficiently generous, and it just simply was not coping beyond the minimal level with the magnitude of the, of the uh, relief uh, 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 burden. So, but that's another agency that he relied upon. I think Red Cross contributions also went down, so the government took over, and Hoover foresaw, he prophesied, that there would be a, a great political corruption to come from that. And there was some in the late 30s, uh, particularly in a couple of states, one of them Kentucky, where in the Senate, Democratic Senate primary in 1938, uh, the FDR con candidate wanted to win, uh, and he was defeating an anti-FDR, or trying to defeat an anti-FDR uh, Democrat. And uh, the men on the WPA were kind of told, you know, if you want to keep those government handouts coming, you know, you know whom you ought to vote for. That caused a national furor because uh, they were, in a sense, government employees, recipients. Uh, and what happened was, and some of you probably know this, the Hatch Act was passed the next year by Congress. This meant that federal civil servant types could not be browbeaten by the, the political people into giving money for campaigns. They would say, I'm hatched, I, you, can't, you can't touch me, I'm neutral. So this was a protection act for the civil service so that the kind of scandal that erupted in Kentucky when money was being used as a kind of a, of a weapon to get people to vote a certain way so that that could not happen again. So Hoover could claim with some justification that he had been vindicated. He had predicted that Roosevelt with the feds taking everything over, would turn this into a kind of a political vote-getting apparatus, and there were some instances in which that happened. Uh, so I think he would uh, be concerned today about the administration of welfare. I think he would be stunned at the thought that we all got $1,000 checks during COVID and so forth. But our, our expectations are different. That was an emergency. It was meant not to last. Uh, so uh, I think that Hoover would, would see some reason for feeling relevant even today, although he would find that the, 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 the geography, the landscape of the government to be quite different. You know, the federal government in, in 1932 or so was uh, some, amounting to something like 5% of GDP, and now it's, what, around 20%. So it's a big government has come. Uh, and, uh, and Hoover would, would uh, I think, have some, some real um, concerns about that. Another question, perhaps? Yes. You mentioned a, a tariff early on. That was a, a pivotal, a pivotal point in this process. Could you explain more why that was so pivotal and, and why it was so contentious? Yes. The uh, 
Republican Party was traditionally the party of high tariffs, going back to the foundation of the Republican Party around the time of the Civil War. And uh, in 1922, a Republican Congress with Harding as president had passed a very high tariff policy which on, on imports as a way of protecting, that was the term protectionism, protecting American industry from cheap labor industry uh, uh, in, in other countries. In 1928, Hoover promised in the campaign that he would do something to help the farmers. The farm, the farm sector of the economy was not prospering very, prospering very much in the 1920s for various reasons. And, and that was traditionally a Republican stronghold, but they were restless. And Hoover, to kind of keep them in the Republican column, promised they would call a special session of Congress to provide relief for agriculture. And one of the forms of relief that Congress proceeded to uh, uh, legislate in 1929, after Hoover called a special session of Congress, was uh, something called the uh, a, a, a Marketing Act to create the Federal Farm Board. But that's that's one track that he followed. But the one on the tariffs was to uh, raise tariffs on imports of agricultural goods that might undercut American farmers and therefore arguably undercut their prosperity. Well, the whole thing got out of hand. Uh, what started off as supposedly a, a, a kind of a focused adjustment of the tariff to give farmers some further protection, whether you think it's a good idea or not, that was the intent. It turned into a general tariff revision by all sorts of, uh, with all sorts of industries uh, lobbying and wanting that. So the outcome eventually, after months and months of haggling in the Congress, was something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff named after uh, Reed Smoot of Utah, Senator, Republican, and uh, Willis Hawley of Oregon in the, in the House. Hoover was not that great a fan of tariffs privately, but what he wanted was to get this mess out of the log rolling in Congress, where I'll, I, you, I'll vote for something that's important to your district if you vote for me, and so everybody was sort of trading in the Congress, and all the rates were being raised, and so it became kind of a carnival, and it caused a lot of public uh, commotion. So f Congress, narrowly in the House, is only 44 to 42, voted uh, this through, uh, in, the, in the Senate, I should say. Uh, the House was not so close. And then Hoover had the question of whether he should sign it. Hoover's interest had not been so much in the, the, the size of the rates, which were already quite high from that earlier 1922 one, but they were now about to go higher still. What Hoover wanted was something called the flexible tariff provision. And that was his rationale, his enemy said his alibi, for signing the bill when he did. Because it gave the executive branch through the Tariff Commission authority to recommend to the president adjustment of the rates upon investigation. So if you tax, put a high tariff on something and someone objected to that and said this is way too high, this is, this is not science, scientific, it's not sound, uh, the Tariff Commission could recommend to the president that he could adjust it downward. So he saw it as a way of getting this out of the hands of this unruly uh, and, and uh, a very uh, short-sighted Congress and get it into the hands of a kind of a rational expert decision-making body, and Hoover had that in him, you know, this sort of faith and expertise, the progressive reformer, the engineer, the man who looks at the data, you know, and doesn't get carried away by emotion to trying to make, make a law. So the bill was passed, and at about the time it passed, the stock market tanked, uh, probably in anticipation that this is going to clog up the the, uh, the realm of commerce between nations. Many foreign countries uh, did not like it and in, in some sense retaliated by raising some of their tariffs on our goods. And the Democrats in particular made a, a fuss about this, arguing that uh, it was going to um, destroy trade and the possibility of economic recovery. Now, it turns out that our foreign trade was very small in proportion to our GDP. Our imports and our exports were less, I think, each less than 5% of the total economic activity. So you could look at it now and say it was not as big a deal as it seemed to be at the time. 
but it did press, put the tariff higher. And the reason uh, Hoover accepted it, as I said, was that he thought that there was a loophole where he could kind of streamline it and get it back down to a, so a lower and sounder level. So the argument among historians has been, and among Democrats and Republicans then, was, was this a catastrophe or not? My own view is that it was, it, it was not a positive thing to do, but I don't believe, and I think many other historians have come to a similar view, that this was somehow the great all-purpose explanation for everything bad that have happened afterward. That, in other words, the importance of the Smoot-Hawley tariff was, was probably overstated. Now, you can still say, if you're a free trader type especially, that it was not a good idea, but I don't think it was the causative factor that turned the garden variety recession into the Great Depression. So I hope that's uh, adequate. Roosevelt kind of was against it, but during the campaign of 32, he had to kind of pull in his horns a little because the farmers in America liked the high tariff and Roosevelt had been promising to lower it and then he realized he might lose the farm vote. So he kind of said, well, we're, we're only gonna, you know, uh, to lower it to a reasonable level and we'll do it by bilateral negotiations. So, so he kind of tried to smooth that over, but that was kind of the politics of the matter. And um, so that, that was kind of the last gasp, though, of tariffs. It, the Smoot-Hawley got such a bad l name, and ever since it's been held up as this kind of catastrophic policy error uh, that uh, we have moved in much more direction of free trade, uh, starting with, uh, I think it was called the Reciprocal Free Trade Act or something close to that in 1934 under FDR. So uh, that's usually held up as a bad example. My only point here is that it, its importance in the total context, I think, has been overstated. I'm not defending the tariff. I'm saying that it's, it's not uh, uh, is somehow the the the, uh, the bugaboo that it was made to be. Thank you, Dr. Nash. Another uh, wonderful lecture. Certainly appreciate the clarity you bring oh, you. to Herbert Hoover. My question is, you would expect from West Michigan, are there any instructive parallels, contrasts, with the Ford presidency? Ford, of course, went through a, a very dire uh, economic situation, uh, not as dire, of course, as the Great Depression, but I'm just curious if you've speculated about that a little bit. Okay, I can try to do that, fair question. Uh, of course, when, when Ford became president, um, very shortly thereafter, the Democrats scored huge gains in the 74 election. And so, uh, like Hoover, in his last two years, uh, Ford faced uh, a hostile Congress, an arrestive Congress, with a presidential election coming up. So there's that, uh, that um, parallel to draw. Uh, Ford, I, I would sense, uh, would call him a kind of an old-fashioned, centrist Republican. Uh, he um, was not one who would, would want to l lurch to the left. Uh, he had one advantage, uh, although I don't think it helped him that much, given the, the emotions raised over Nixon's impeachment attempt and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and Ford's pardoning of him, and then the sharp economic, uh, concurrent economic uh, decline, and uh, then the falling apart of South Vietnam at the same time. So there is a whole host of, of things happening on Ford's watch that made it an uphill climb for him. But one thing he did have that Hoover lacked was a, uh, Ford was a man of the Congress. And so he, he knew how to deal with the political class. Hoover was an outsider. Now he had good friends and allies in Congress, but he was not generally liked by members of Congress, particularly the conservative wing of the Republican Party, who thought he was too much of a progressive. Whereas the progressives in the Republican Party, the so-called rhinos of the day, uh, La Follette and uh, Norris of Nebraska, and they were called by one of the conservative senators, sons of the wild jackass, because they were so cantankerous and uh, not clubbable, they didn't work in harmony, and they held the kind of the balance of power in the Senate. And many of them hated Hoover, whom they thought was a f insufficient progressive. And one of the, a historian once said of Hoover that he was too progressive for the conservatives and too conservative for the radicals. So he kind of fell in in between. So I, I think Trump, did, I, Ford was did not come to be disliked the way that. Hoover came to be disliked. Uh, Trump, uh, rather, uh, Ford did not have uh, the same um, weight to bear in personal terms. Hoover, it was personalized for Hoover. 
you know, the, it, there were Hoovervilles in this country. Some of you have heard that. These are unemployed people living in shanty towns on the edge of cities. Uh, the, um, the, armadillo, the armadillo was nicknamed the Hoover Hog because there was so little meat on an armadillo. Uh, blankets, you put a newspaper over yourself on a park bench. Uh, that was a Hoover blanket. So Hoover was, was vilified, and so he had come in with this great expectations, almost this wonder worker, this great engineer, this great humanitarian, and yet he, and so many people personalized their, their anger and, and took it out on Hoover. Uh, the, the joke that went around in 32, which Roosevelt told on the campaign trail even, was that there was a hobo who held up a sign saying, uh, he, he, he was hitchhiking, and he said, uh, sign says, give me a ride or I'll vote for Hoover. And supposedly he crossed the country in 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> so Hoover, uh, it, it's too bad because Hoover, I do believe, cared. But he did not have a, a kind of a persona that uh, exuded that, whereas Roosevelt had what was called the big smile and this, this sense of fatherly, Concern, And so Roosevelt had something that Hoover lacked, and that was that kind of empathy that he could uh, have with people. Hoover could share that empathy, particularly uh, in private settings, uh, but it was harder for him to project that way. So one of Hoover's political weaknesses was that people saw him as just this, this stern uh, figure, uh, always working, always uh, droning on about, uh, about our ideals and so on. And so uh, he, he lost out. I don't think that um, Gerald Ford suffered quite to that degree, but he, he did have headwinds, and um, some of them you could analogize to Hoover's. Thank you so much for joining us today, and let's give a round of applause to Dr. Nash. Thank you. Thank you.